Uh, up next we've got Adrian Moat from Container Solutions, uh, author of the upcoming book from O'Reilly using Docker. And he's going to be talking about Docker Run Start 4th of Oh no, wait a minute. Using Docker safely. So, uh, yeah, my name is Adrian Moore, as you figured out. Um, I'm currently Chief Scientist at Container Solutions. Uh, and I'm going to talk today, before I should also say I'm Mike Mosser, as Mark kindly said, I'm writing that we're rather good with Docker, or using Docker. And that's the main focus on it, or someone to get me back. But anyway, I'm going to talk today on Docker security, and in particular how you can use Docker safely. So, if you follow like a Docker online, you read blogs, um, on the news and so on, you've probably seen a lot of negative comments on Docker security. So, one of the most famous articles was by Dan Walsh, and he wrote one that said that containers don't contain. And that's a great article, by the way, it's just read it. Another one was by the founder of Flynn.io, and he wrote, there was a total systemic failure of all logic related to image security. And there's also a guy who knows what he's talking about. Um, I should guess, I suppose I should say, that things have changed since that a little bit. Um, also, Alex Larson in the uh, Red Hat <coughs> employee, in response to uh, a blog by one of the Docker engineers and wrapping desktop apps in, in Docker, he said that effectively gives apps root access. So, these are the comments by people I respect. There's also been a lot of comments by people that don't really know what they're talking about, uh, and trolls and so on. I've not linked that at all, but these ones are so given that, why do I, do I think that containers can be used securely? Well, I'm going to say yes. And by the end of this talk, hopefully you'll agree with me. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things you'd be worrying about when you're talking about dealing with security in a container or microservice-based micro system. Uh, I'll talk about primary defenses you should be thinking about. And I'll also include some specific tips and techniques. So I guess everybody here knows enough about Docker, so we'll go into some specific details. But yeah, I think you're all hardcore enough. So first thing to point out, as I'm sure you're all aware, Docker shares the kernel between hosts and the container. So if one container can attack the kernel, if you've managed to like, cause a kernel panic or something, I'll bring down, so I can use some more. He'll bring down the He'll bring down the host and all the containers with it. Unlike if you're in a VM, you just bring down at the end. By the way, does anybody get the popcorn picture? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mumbles. <laughs> okay. Somebody will explain it to you next year. I think it works better in English than that. Um, and similar to that, if you can um, monopolize one of the kernel resources because the kernel is shared, you can like grab all the CPU or you can grab all the memory you can starve out the other containers and effectively cause a nano service. And these things may be malicious, but they could be accidental. And container breakouts. So it's safe to say that current Docker in particular and also the underlying Linux um, technology, C groups and namespaces are relatively new technologies. And you are going to see exploits against them. That's just a fact. And so container breakouts are a possibility. And you need to assume in your security that container breakouts are unlikely but possible. And I guess I should say by container breakout, I mean if you have access to a container, you have to manage to get access to the host or to another container. Um, poisoned images. So, and there's been a few articles about this recently as well. So a lot of images have vulnerabilities. Like they're old and you don't want to be using them because they're using an old version of software. Or an attacker may be able to like, insert a Trojan or virus into an image and trick you into downloading that. Uh, so I'll talk a, a few later a little bit how you can uh, avoid using poison images. Also, a secret. So if you're using I mean, a secret, uh, you always have to share secrets if you're using VMs or raw hardware. You have to figure out how to get the sensitive passwords and API tokens onto the machines you're using. But it was even more important in the microservice world, microservice world because you've got containers coming up and going down the whole time. So it becomes even, you know, you don't have the, the luxury of time. You can't just sit and put them in by hand. You have to come up with an automated way of doing things. So 
the secrets become a bit more interesting in a microservices world. So given all that, um, your primary strategy when thinking about Docker security needs to be on defense and depth. And by that I mean you've got multiple layers of defense. So you think about a castle, and it doesn't just have a moat, it's also got big huge walls made of block, it's also got battlements, um, the fins are shooting at you, it's also got a, a drawbridge, and even if you like, would get past all those defenses, there'd be keeps inside of people armed with swords. So there's multiple layers of defense designed against different sorts of attack, and even if you manage to get past one of them, there'll be something else to try and get past. So that's the idea of defense and depth. Um, in the container world, you want to be thinking of your lines of defense. Instead of city walls, you've got VMs and containers to provide a little bit of isolation. You want to be thinking about how to encrypt your communications and your sensitive data. Uh, you also want to think about monitoring. So you know when something's gone wrong, perhaps something's broken in, when a process has gone out of control, etc. Then auditing, so you want to go back and look at your images and check if you've got running, like, run, runnable versions of libraries, etc. Yeah, so I talked briefly there about virtual machines. Then virtual machines are going to form a central part of most container deployments going forward. It might sound a bit contradictory, but the simple fact is that virtual machines are a lot more secure. Uh, and part of this is just because uh, they have a better chance of being secure, because in between the virtual machine and the kernel inside the virtual machine, you've got the hypervisor before you get to the host kernel, as opposed to containers when you're talking directly to the host kernel. Um, yeah, so you want to be thinking about putting your containers inside the virtual machines or at least on different physical hosts. Uh, and you should be doing that by user, if you're using a multi-tenant situation. So for example, if you look at Amazon or you look at Google, uh, if you run containers are using their offerings, those containers will be running in the VM that's only used by you. So your containers never run next to somebody else's container. They're always isolated by level of VMs. Similarly, you can also do this for data. So imagine you have a bunch of containers working on sensitive uh, bank account details, something like that. Those containers should not be running in the same VM or host as a, like no JS front end. So you segregate things by sort of security privilege as well as by user. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but basically if you give somebody access to start and run Docker containers, you're effectively giving them root access to the host. I mean, if you can start a Docker container, you can just mount the root file system and then you can do whatever you like. So, if you give somebody Docker privileges, just consider having them like sudo or su rights to the host machine. Uh, so you've got to be very careful that you give access to Docker. And if you run a remote API, please make sure it's very secure. Uh, control who has access to keys. And you should also only make it accessible via a private network or a VPN, as opposed to the internet at large, unless you want bad things to happen. Um, so, if you went back to the containers do not contain quote, what Dan Moss was really getting at is that not everything's namespace inside a Docker container. Um, and by namespace, I mean you don't get your own thing of everything. And one of the things you don't get your own version of is users. So, a user in a container is the same UID in the host. And that includes the root. So, the root user in the container is the same as the root user in the host. If you have access to a container, and you manage to break out the container onto the host, you will then be rooting the host. Um, I should say that there is a, currently a pull request, I think it hopefully landed in 1.7, uh, that involves namespace and root, so root will be a random high number user in the container, but that's not there yet. And even then, I guess there'll be issues with volumes, I'm not quite sure how they're going to solve that, because of course the privileges will be wrong. Uh, but anyway, it's very important and one of the most important security things in Docker is to set a user. Uh, so all your applications should run as a user, they shouldn't run as root. So the way you do this is you create a user in your Docker file, which will look something like that. So that'll just create a user called user and add it to a user group. Uh, and then you can need to switch that user for your application. You can either do that in the Docker file by writing user or user. Or you can do it like an entry point script or a command script and then you use something like su sudo, or it's also an application called GoSu. GoSu is actually very interesting. It's written by a Docker engineer to address some of the issues with sudo. 
So if you switch to a, a user with sudo, the problem is you get two processes. You get like a sudo process and the actual process you want. Go through just in with one process. So it's a little bit nicer. So it will handle uh, forwarding of um, system calls properly. Interrupt, sorry. Another interesting one, I like this one quite a lot, is you can set the container file system to read only. So the, can, the application can't write anything to disk at all. And this gets into ideas of immutable infrastructure and so on. But it's also very good for security, because an attacker, if you can break in, you can't write sensitive data. Also, you can't, say, write a script file and trick the application into running. And it's also very good for auditing. So if you've got a read-only file system, then you can be sure that your container hasn't changed from the image it's run from. So you can do your auditing on the offline image rather than on the running container. Uh, similarly, um, you can also set your volume to read only. I guess I should say um, most containers aren't, you know, most applications are going to want to write files. So there's not too many applications that you'll be able to run read only. But you should be able to set the root file system read only, or sort of container file system read only, and then volumes, perhaps, like as a temp and so on, or wherever your application needs to write data, and then you control where it can write to. Also quite an interesting technique. Yeah, so very similar, you can set volumes to read only here, and you do that just by passing the colon arrow at the end. Then capabilities. So are most of you familiar with Linux capabilities? A few nods. It shoots the head. Okay, so Linux capabilities basically control which privileges you have inside the kernel. Um, and Docker there's a, a set of maybe 32, maybe it's more than that, um, privileges that you can have and need like uh, control things like whether or not you like to set time, whether or not like you like to make network calls, whether or not you like to, in this case, create set UID binaries or change UID and GID and processes and things like that. And by default, uh, a Docker container has a, a subset of those, quite a large subset. Then you can get a, a more complete subset so it's almost identical to a root user by passing dash dash privilege. Or you can um, add specific privileges and drop specific privileges with cap drop and cap add. Um, you can also just drop all the privileges and add back the ones you need. Uh, and this is pretty good and it's very good for security, but there's a couple of issues. One, it's not necessarily obvious which kernel um, calls your application is going to make. So you can try this drop all, and you know maybe your application works, probably doesn't, and start adding them back. But you know you've got to go through testing the whole application to see which ones it needs. And also the big problem is a sysadmin capability. And the sysadmin capability has become a bit of a catch-all. So the, sys the sysadmin capability is basically turned into root again, if you like, so it's got part of the tune. So capabilities are good, and use it where you can, but yeah, it's not perfect. Uh, Linux security modules. So this is a, a kernel module. It runs in the kernel. Uh, the kernel calls it after doing the file access level controls and uh, to check whether or not uh, process are allowed to perform an operation. Uh, there's a few big ones. The main ones are SE Linux and AppArmor. So SE Linux is probably the largest one. And if you run in your containers Docker and Red Hat, You've probably got SLinux installed, but if not, you've turned on, it's another question. It's actually written by NSA, which I didn't realize until recently. Quite as interesting, I thought. Uh, it's basically policy-based. Uh, so you write policies on what your uh, containers and processes can do. It's something called mandatory access control, as opposed to discretionary access control, which I believe is how you, you term uh, the normal file-based access control. But mandatory access control is the idea of types. So you apply a type to a process or a user, and uh, also to objects. And whether or not a process or user can access an object depends on whether the types match. Uh, and it covers things as well as file access, it covers things like sockets and interfaces. Uh, the big problem is you try and turn it on, this is a royal pain in the arse. Uh, one is hard to define your own policy. So I wanted to define a policy for Nginx that said, okay, this container can open ports, but only port 80 and port 443. And I spent an hour or two trying to do that, and I failed miserably. And it was just a pain. 
Also, you have to use device mapper currently. I think there is work currently on admin overlay. But that's actually not as big a problem as you think it is because if you're running uh, SQLinux, chances are you're running Red Hat. If you're running Red Hat, chances are you're using device mapper. Um, the thing that will really surprise you if you try and turn it on though is volumes just suddenly break. So if you try and mount a volume and you just turn on SE Linux, you're just going to get permission denied. And you won't understand why unless you understand SE Linux. So it's not really a very good user story here. But uh, yeah, so basically here we created a file and it's just mounted it inside the container and we can't even read from it. And now, you know, we've got root privilege inside the container. So you would expect to be able to read it, but you can't. The reason why types don't match. So the container runs with this uh, SVR sandbox file type, and uh, your file is this type. So that's why you can't read from it. The solution is to pass the chcon, uh, or to run the chcon argument on whatever data you want to make the container. But that's clearly a little bit annoying. Although it is, you know, I guess in a way it's saying whatever data a container can access has to be labeled as okay for a container to access. So in a way it's good, but it's a little bit annoying. I think in the next version of Docker there is going to be a uh, flag you can pass when you mention the volume, so you pass like the Z flag and then it will automatically apply the stage con. Yeah. I can repeat it. Do you know that you can just run SC Linux in permissive mode, yeah, log yeah. everything that it does, and then you can ensure your... Well, what's the point? I mean, it's not protecting anybody. No. So the first thing is you test it, you run it in permissive mode, you see all the permissions that it takes, and you can convert that to actual SC Linux. Yeah, yeah I understand. But what if it happens is everybody just leaves in permissive mode and they're both? So it's... Yeah, and it defeats the purpose. The other thing I don't like about it is none of your developers are going to use it, because they might have one in production. So you end up back in a situation where development is in production, and things work in development and not in production, which is what Docker was meant to take away from. So I'm not a huge fan of SE Linux. I think it is going to be big in the future, and they will come up with a better user story, I guess. So it will get there, but it's not perfect at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can set a, a, a recursive uh, as a Linux context on the target directory. Yeah. That, so that's all that was dash uh, yeah. yeah. Actually, the first time I tried it, I didn't. I just went up the file. I just went to chcon in the file, which is interesting because then you can read from it, but you can't write to it. Just stumble, another stumble ball. Uh, yeah, so App Armor, um, I didn't actually realize, but this, if you've been on Debian or Ubuntu, you are actually using App Armor probably already. Um, yeah, so it's on by default, and it does kind of the same thing, but it's not as fine grained and not as powerful as SE Linux. Um, what is happens is that every time you start a container, Docker will apply the App Armor profile to that container, which limits what you can do. Um, I also think you can pass in your own policy. For, you, for a container, I can turn off the app armor policy if you have a problem with it. Um, you can change the default policy at the minute, however. And if you do try to change the default policy, if it just lives in the file, you can do that, but then Docker will come and overwrite it and reboot it. So I suspect again that will change in future versions. Yeah, app armor is useful, but it's not as fine grained as SE Linux, so. Okay, other stuff um, set in CPU shares. So you can write. Um, so, I mean, here the problem clearly is you don't want one container to grab all the CPU and starve out the other containers. So, you can set CPU limit, but in reality you probably don't want to because they're relatively weighted. So, by default, every container gets a, an equal share. But, but, just to explain what I mean by relatively weighted, um, in this case we run three images. The default weighting, which you just have to know, is 1024. So, if you don't specify a CPU weighting, you get the default weight of 1024. So we create an image with the default weight of 1024, and then two variables of 512. 
And what happens is this one can take up half the CPU and these two can take up a quarter each. These only come into play when uh, you end up with a fully loaded system. Does that make sense? Um, a bit more interesting is memory limits. So you can set the maximum memory a uh, container can take up, which clearly lets you stop a, a container from grabbing all the memory on the host. So that can be a very useful one to stop denial of service. You can also set the memory for the swap as well. Oh, here's an interesting one, inter-container communication. So how many people have heard of the ICC flag? Quite a few. Have anybody like, tried ching turning it off? Okay, did it work? No, yeah, cool. Um, right, so the idea is if you pass dash dash ICC with the false, it stops all your containers from being able to communicate with each other. Actually, you might have noticed, like, um, if you have containers, the default in Docker Bridge, all containers can talk to each other. So whether or not they're linked or whatever, you can go and access ports and other containers. It doesn't matter if they're exposed or published or whatever. Everything's open by default. So you can turn it off, and containers can't talk to each other at all by passing dash dash ICC for the false. Which is great, especially from a security point of view, because then the containers can't attack each other. But it's, it's a bit useless, really, because um, clearly, if you're running containers, you want your uh, application container to be able to talk to your database container. And you can't do that if you turn it off into container communication. So what you do is you, put, you set the IP tables command on the Docker page. And the idea is that allows linked containers to communicate. I'm not entirely sure why they called it dash dash IP tables. It does just mean link containers, link containers get an IP table for us to communicate. But I mean, Docker sits in place with IP tables, like you pass this command as well. So it doesn't mean we can, Docker's now allowed to play with IP tables. It already was. Um, anyway, so you pass ICC for false and dash dash IP tables. The idea is only link containers can communicate, which is a great default. And I suggest you try it, but it's a good chance it might not work for you. Uh, one thing is it's dependent on kernel permissions. So you have to have these uh, parameters set. And if you don't have that, um, I think it, you'd probably get a warning, but it won't stop the daemon from starting, and ICC won't be turned off. So that's perhaps a bit confusion. confusing. <laughs> also, I should say, uh, boot to Docker. You can't do it in boot to Docker, because it doesn't have this set at the minute. Um, I ran into a problem where I turned ICC with the false, and then I did. Uh, then I tried running it with um, dash dash IP tables, but even my link containers couldn't communicate then. And after about an hour of frustration, I figured out that what had happened was it put the drop rule in the wrong place. And I went on GitHub, and sure enough, there wasn't an issue, but there was a pull request to fix it. So that's fixed upstream. Um, last night I tried it again in Red Hat. Well, not Red Hat, in CentOS. Uh, and I turned ICC up to false, and it didn't do anything when it continues to still communicate. So it's definitely a bit buggy, but um, in the future, I think that is a good default setting. Um, verifying images. So this goes back to the poison image idea. You want to be sure that all the images you're running are the images you think they are, and uh, come from you think they come from. Um, for starters, I would only ever use a Docker image that came from an automated build and you had a linked Docker file and source, otherwise you just have no idea what you're getting. Um, preferably, I would just build the image myself. So like, uh, <coughs> just go to the GitHub page and download the, the, <coughs> the project and build it. Failing that, um, in Docker 1.6, it was a great step forward because they started having digests. And that's basically a SHA hash of an image. An image. And then um, you pull by the digest, which looks like that. I know it's a very big and unwieldy number. But if you use that to grab your images, then you can be absolutely certain that you're getting what you think you're getting. If you pull by uh, a tag name, then one, that tag can change over time. So it might, you might call one thing one day and something completely different another day. But the other thing is, there's no check in there. There's no checks that's been applied. So, but if you pull by this, 
it will verify that what you've pulled matches that checksum. So you can be absolutely certain that you're getting what you think you're getting. And it hasn't been plate tampered with in the host or anywhere, or in transfer. Um, a lot of the images, the default Debian image and Ubuntu, etc., have various set UID and set GID binaries inside them. But the thing is, most of them you don't need. Like your applications, they're probably not called meant to these binaries. So why don't we get rid of them? Um, so for example, you run on Debian, you run this find command. I guess most of you familiar with find? Maybe. It's a bit sysadmin, I know. But if you run this rather complicated looking find command, you can find all the... Have you seen some more? No. You can pause as much as you like, sorry. Um, yeah, so if you run this command, you'll find all the set UID and set GID stuff. And there's more than what I'm showing there, it's just a, a snippet. But, I mean, for example, hands up if you know what that does. So, I mean, I do, but I, I figure most people have no idea what CHFN does. Does anybody know what it does? Oh, it changes something, well done. <laughs> uh, has anybody heard of finger? Yeah, yeah so this is change finger in. But why on earth? I don't actually understand why that's in the... I guess it probably got installed by some default package, but I, mean, I don't think there's any need for that to be in the container at all. And it's set UID, so somebody was to find a, a, a bug in it. Sorry, I should have explained it. Set UID binary, this has escalated privileges. So if somebody finds a, a bug in a set UID binary, they can potentially uh, use that to escalate the privileges. So they run as a user, but they manipulate the set UID binary, and they end up being the root user. So, yeah, we don't need these, so we can just get rid of them. And what you can do is just add a line like this to your uh, Docker files, and what that'll do is exactly the same find command, but this time we're just going to remove the set UID bit from those binaries. Uh, yeah, question? We got the point. See a big throw to the back. Watch the cameraman. Not hit the cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good punch. You're a goalkeeper. <laughs> okay. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you can do that, but thanks to the magic of Docker layers, the file won't actually disappear. Yeah. So is it there a way to still get at it? I don't. I don't know. It's a good question with you. Um, I don't think so. Not from inside the container. I mean, yeah, you can get to the image. Yeah, the layers are applied on top of each other, and so you can modify the base layer with whatever you do on top. So literally, if there's a layer that does something in the next layer and can't send anything out, the final result, this result, of the part of the layer is still applied to the actual layer. I mean, you could, uh, you could definitely like um, run the, you know, that layer is going to be there, like you said. So if you were to run the image from the layer above, you'd have access to that non situ ID binary. But from the running container, I think it should be fairly safe. Certainly a lot safer than, than it arguably was. I'm possibly making a bit much of this situation because the default, like these binaries inside uh, Debian, those are all ancient, so I assume they've been very much tested and so on. But it's definitely not possible if somebody could find a bug in it. Yeah, so if you do that, you add that link to your um, Docker file, you will find you now have no set UID binaries, which is quite nice. Okay, final bit. Um, oh, it's just how you share secrets in containers. And this is a story that's not quite complete yet, to be honest. Um, by the way, this cat, it's a cat in London, and it got in trouble because it was, had a magnetic collar. And it was going around neighbors' gardens, like digging up their spare keys. And it would return home with all these keys from like, the neighbors. <laughs> He got a little bit annoyed, but he did quite well. He liked characters and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so you want to share your secrets um, to your container. How do you do it? Well, the first thing that might occur to you is you can just write it straight into your image. So, and your Docker file, you just do a copy secret file into the container, into the image file. And then it's available to your container. And by secrets, I mean, I mean like uh, API tokens, etc. Um, yeah, so. What if you do, probably realize that you don't want to do that. So the problem with putting in your image is that anybody that's access to the image, has access to the tokens, can then go in front of a big AWS bill or whatever. 
Um, also, you might accidentally push the image to Docker Hub or whatever, and then everybody else has access to your keys. So don't do that one. The next one, a lot of people do suggest this, but I'm not a huge fan of it, is uh, to put your secrets in environment variables. So you do like dash e API token is equal to blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that works, and uh, has gained a lot of popularity from 12 factor apps. Has anybody heard of 12 factor apps? See, I know you have, yeah. Cool. So 12 factor apps is sort of a popular style of um, modern style of writing applications, and I agree with 90% of it, but it's written more for VMs, and the story with environment variables with VMs is a little bit better. Um, so I don't recommend you do this, and basically the reason is that environment variables in Docker can be seen in many places. So if you link to your container, the link container gets access to all the environment variables the container is linked to. And also if I run Docker inspect, I can see all the environment variables and all the keys, etc. So it ends up in too many places. And also you can't delete environment variables. So you know if I run Docker inspect, you know, it's not like you can use a key, then remove the environment variable. It's still there, but we still get to it. So if you don't use environment variables, what you're left with? Well, chances are you're going to end up using uh, volumes, which... Um, so you just put the secrets into a file, and you map that in as a volume. Uh, most of you are probably thinking it's a bit icky. And you're right, it's not great. But it's better than environment variables, and you, know, you can certainly read only and so on. Um, the main issue with it is that the file can get checked in by accident. So if you put your secrets into files, Somebody checks up the source code and you really don't want to be there and yes. then you have to go and change them all, etc. So again, that's not perfect, but I reckon that's probably what you're going to end up doing. Uh, third option, put it in a key value store. And this is probably the way going forward. Um, so you can do things like etcd. And etcd also has a thing called trip that I think some of the CoreOS guys worked on. That will encrypt things you put in there. So basically the container goes out to the key value store and gets its uh, values from there. There's also a vault from Ansible which just came out recently, which is intended to be something very similar. And it also has things where I think you can like, you know, pass a command to lock down the vault and nobody can get passwords out, etc. There's also one called Keywords. Oh yeah? Oh yeah, yeah, right. So, but, right, this is quite new as well, right? So what's my, one of my things is they're all very new, and you're trusting like very sensitive data with it. Um, but I think in the early future, because you can, you've got more control over your keys and so on, you can do things like uh, only allow them to exist for a certain amount of time, or perhaps once they've been downloaded, they get wiped, etc. You can also make sure they're still encrypted and have like lockdown commands, etc. But I, and I don't really understand this much to keep with. I guess you have to have some sort of authentication token before you can access. Can somebody throw us to the box? Oh, okay. oh. This works. Great. So, uh, KeyWiz, the way that it stores secrets is actually pretty cool. Uh, I'm obviously biased, since I was one of the people that built it. But let me just address the comment. Uh, KeyWiz has been used at large scale in production at a company that moves hundreds of millions of dollars per day. And it's being used in production for it's thousands of days. Yeah, for, for over three years. So this is something that was actually battle tested. It just got open sourced a couple months ago, and that's why it seems new. But it's been used internally for years, and it was really hard to open source it because reasons. Um, specifically, the way that it uh, stores secrets is actually really cool. It creates a FuseFS mount point, so it creates a virtual file system on your hosts, and it pretends that all of the secrets are just files. So from the point of view of our application, it's just accessing a file, loading a file from disk. But in reality, what's happening is it's actually going to the FuseFS file system, and it's calling an API on a centralized server. And that centralized server is the thing that loads the secrets. And since the secrets are only in memory, they're never written to disk, we make sure of it, with some capabilities of Linux, and they're never written to swap. And so if a server gets pulled out of the data center, it has exactly zero secrets in disk. There is a bootstrap problem, and the bootstrap problem is it requires a TLS certificate, and that's how it identifies the central server, that it is who it says it is. But once you have that certificate, it actually has on the C name the group that it belongs to, so it only gets the secrets that that specific host is supposed to. So literally, if you have a web host, it only gets the web secrets. And there's like this so, system with groups So how are you passing the certificate? Do you have the volume? 
so the certificate, the way that I've been thinking about it, and I'm obviously trying to put keywords into Docker, um, I'm very biased on this, but the way that I've been thinking about it is that a container runs, and the moment the container runs, it should be ran with an environmental variable that is one use secret. So imagine it as a one use token, a single use token. And do not quote me on this, this is very much of a work in progress. But that one use token can be used to call to a centralized server and say, look, I just got run, this is my ID of web, this is my unique one use token, give me a valid certificate. And then from that moment on, the container runs, gets its own certificate, and then it can bootstrap the secrets. So this is how I solved in my head the bootstrap problem. Because it's a one use secret yeah. that gets past an environmental variable that we all know, and so if it gets logged, nobody cares. Yeah, okay, that's cool, I like that. That's probably the best thing I've heard of, but uh... <laughs> Stop stealing my talk! <laughs> That's another question. The question was how does it compare to Vault? So how, how does QWIS compare to Vault? Um, <laughs> can you speak into the queue? I think they are here. Guys, so maybe they can talk about like five minutes about Vault. So five minutes, my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> you want to think anybody Vault? Uh, I have to talk about after the Well, I have to So, but I'm just curious, what's, uh, how does it compare to Vault? Yeah, no, not great, that's what I did. Okay. We're going to do security key values to the lightning from the strap. Anyway, I think. <laughs> I think this is the future, but it's not quite there yet, and clearly people are arguing about what their solution is. Yeah. Anyway, don't that be because of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All I wanted to really say was, there's a lot of different aspects of container security. If you get it wrong, it can go badly wrong. You know, you end up giving good access to people. So that was why people complained, or Alex Larson's point about wrapping desktop apps on Docker, is, um, if you don't give them a user, they end up being broken, you give them more access than you should have. However, the opposite point of view is if you take an application, you wrap it in a documentary yourself, you've isolated it, um, and then it's more secure. So you get things right, you've got um, defense in depth, you get things wrong, you've got things worse. If you get it right, I would argue that you've got another layer of security and it's more secure than you should be in. Uh, Dolby, do you want to say something? Hello? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I get the feeling that container technology is no more or less secure than many other technologies, but it's how you use it. And if you're stupid, you'll have security holes. Uh, and when, and um, the thing is, VMs are more, people see Docker containers as VMs, and VMs are just naturally more secure. That, that I accept. Yeah, but I, I mean, when we used to build, well, when we used to build, when I used to build, you know, big systems, it was all the security problems came from human error and stupidity. And some technologies would protect you a little bit from that, but not totally. Yeah. So I, I get a bit pissed off when I hear this Docker is not secure argument because mainly the people spouting it, I wouldn't trust them with a with a with a, with a JVM and Eclipse. <laughs> so you know I wouldn't trust them with a container either. And well, that's the feeling I get. Yeah, some of them I definitely agree, but the guys at the start are all like very good security guys. Um, but basically, the three points I showed, they're all, I, I date slightly like the image security one has been addressed to a large degree by, uh, by Jess, and I think from four we've got like a sign to digest, which addresses the other part of the story. Um, yeah, and containers don't contain, so there's like namespaces, and that's just something to be aware of more than anything else. So there is a few, but... Okay, any more questions? Hello, yes, very good. Okay, um, hi. My life it's, it's my turn now. Are there more questions? Were there more yeah, questions? More okay, get the get the cube down the back, Dobbo. Go long. Oh yeah, we like that. Oh, yes, yes, good. I get off stage then. So so my question is how is the hash uh, uh, determined? Yeah, it's uh, content based, yeah. Sorry? It's content based, so it's a hash. Of the image, it's a, well, the hash of the manifest and the layer. So, yeah, so, so if, if I have an Ubuntu security update and I rebuild my container, 
and it contains some new uh, security updates yeah. from, from my app repository. Yeah. Uh, does my hash change? Yeah. So how can I um, rebuild the container and have the same hash? You can. It's all kind of hash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then, then there, is a, there is an issue there in the sense yeah. that if I don't have my binary, I don't know why the hash changed. And I can't easily access the previous... Well, hash doesn't mean the hash doesn't change at all. If you pull the hash, you get exactly the same thing, which may not have updates that you want. It doesn't go away, it's always there. No, sure, sure. So, so there is a sense for having hashes change. I see that point. But how do you address the issue that if there is a security uh, update issue, you need some extra sort of layer of management or administration to, so, to notice that the hash changed, but you do actually want this change because it's a security update and not a malicious. So internally, I probably wouldn't use hashes. Like I'm really talking about using hashes to download securely from the Docker Hub, which is an outside network. Um, but internally, you probably use like a, a tag, and then you you have like a tag assigned to like a minor or major version, and you get the updates for minor or major version. And uh, if you use Debian, uh, one of the interesting things about Debian is your version number can say exactly the same you'll still get like certain security updates. So even if you keep exactly the, the same version number to like the final point, that can change over time. Yes, right. exactly. But then uh, I need to, to so uh, administrate my basically. binaries carefully and not just check in the, the, the source of the Docker file because the app repository changes. And I am building my Docker file with app get update, app get install, app get clean, yeah. right? Yeah. So there is a sort of challenge on how to properly Yeah, if you basically it. rebuild a Docker file, there's a good chance your hash is going to change, yeah. Okay. And, and how, how do we... Is, to be fair, going forward, there is going to be signing of hashes. And then you can just, you know, you, you don't... And then um, you can download things by tag and be a bit more um, certain that what you're getting is comes from what you think it's coming from. So that's one of my issues with uh, using just a tag at the minute, is that it could have been like modified in the server with somebody else. And, um, you know, you have no way of telling. But it, once you get uh, some sort of keys in there, then whoever modifies it has to have the key to be able to sign the hash. If you know I, mean. I can explain later, so I've not explained that very well. Yeah, it, it will be interesting for some, uh, in some way, I just sort of thinking out loud, right, to have sort of hash of the Docker file that was used to build an image. Because, because you trust the upstream repository, whatever, version of security update was there. Does that make sense? I'm going to suggest that right you guys take this to the bar yeah. <laughs> during the break. Does that sound good, Eric? I'm happy, yeah. Yeah, take off. Good. good. Okay, big round of applause for Adrian, please. It's so cool to work in. We don't need to entice people with 20% discounts or trips to Bali. And if you work in Swaller, we're not interested. <laughs> Container, Solutions is, <laughs> Container Solutions is a really, really nice, friendly company. We're down on Light Supply. We're building uh, Cisco's microservices platform. And it's really cool. We do Mesos frameworks, we do DCOS frameworks, we use Vault for secrets. I'm sorry about Kiwis, I've only just found out about it tonight. We will consider it. Uh, we write books, we drink a lot of wine and coffee and beer. We're looking for anybody who's interested in building businesses. We're active in uh, across Europe, we're probably Europe's leading uh, thinkers and uh, you know, deliverers of container solutions and block and stuff like that. So if you're interested, come and find me. We'd be interested in speaking to you. Uh, thank you.